Hello and welcome to the 38th annual Florida State University Young Scholars Program Research Symposium. Before we get started, I would like to introduce myself and thank a few of the people who make this program possible. I am Dr. Erica Staling, the Associate Director of the Office of STEM Teaching Activities and Co-Director of the Young Scholars Program. With, with us today, we also have Barbara Shoplock, Co-Director of the Young Scholars Program. Barb's tireless effort to see the opportunity and the challenges and embrace the reality of the situation we all find ourselves in and make the most of it and to coordinate collaborations across the university, across the state, and across the country are, are a large part of what made this program possible. I'm so grateful to have her as my co-director and I wanted to take a moment just to offer my heartfelt thanks before we get going. <laughs> yes, hands. <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank the director of the Office of STEM Teaching Activities, Dr. Ellen Granger, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Sam Huckaba, who will also speak shortly, FSU's Vice President of Research, Dr. Gary Ostrander, FSU's Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Sally McRory, and last but not least, President John Thrasher. Thank you to all of the FSU faculty and administrators who continually support the Young Scholars Program and enable us to provide this unique opportunity to the best and brightest high school students from all over the state of Florida each year. Thank you also to our collaborators who made it possible to take YSP online and make our open access research concept a reality, including the folks at the FSU STEM libraries for their expertise and willingness to help us envision and enact this summer's open access research experience, especially Renee Julian, the folks at the NSF National Ecological Ob Observatory Network, NEON, um, for providing access and training on the NEON data sets that the students then use to develop and answer research questions that you'll be hearing about shortly, especially Dr. Donald O'Leary and Dr. Megan Jones, the folks at SciTeens for providing a platform for asynchronous mentorship for our students, especially John Suter and Carlos Mercado Lara. And um, although we're focusing on the open access research this afternoon, I'd also like to thank our academic course instructors as well, including Drs. Garay Octon, Brian Ewald, and Alexander Reznikov from the Department of Mathematics, and Mr. Kyle Shaw from the Department of Scientific Computing. Today we're celebrating the culmination of the 38th year of the Young Scholars Program, and this was an exceptional year in more than one way. Um, the students who are about to present are truly some of the best and brightest from all over the state of Florida. Here are some quick facts about this YSP class. There were over 235 students who applied for 40 positions, um, all of whom were impressive and met our rigorous baseline requirements. 100% of our top applicants that we selected agreed to join us this summer and followed through to complete the entire program. Of the students who joined us, over 80% of them are in the top 5% of their high school class. They collectively have an average unweighted GPA of 3.99 out of 4.0 and an average standardized test score in math and reading above the 98th percentile. It's a very impressive bunch. Um, given those statistics, you might think that this would be a very cutthroat bunch of young people, but we have been so proud of the positive attitudes they have had, their capacity for collaboration and friendship, and the tenacity and perseverance they've exhibited in the face of difficulty this summer. We are confident they will go on to do great things and are excited to share their work with you today. Unfortunately, Dean Huckaba couldn't be with us live today, but he wanted to share a few words of encouragement with the program staff, volunteers, and students. And so I have a video to play. Welcome everyone to this year's YSP Symposium. It is one of the many events we've held online here at Florida State as we continue trying to adapt to the pandemic. And we're starting to figure that out. All participants succeeded remarkably well at adapting to a remote format and seeing it through to completion. There are many individuals to recognize for their important roles. And with that in mind, it is a pleasure to thank the following. All YSP course instructors and scientific mentors who provided invaluable guidance to students. The FSU Library System staff for helping provide IT assistance. The NSF's NEON Research Group who provided data and research expertise. SciTeams for providing a platform and mentorship. Ellen Granger, Director of OSTA. OSTA is the office that sponsors and organizes the YSP. And speaking of OSTA, a special thank you to Barbara Shoplock, Erica Stalling, and Teresa Callahan for your tireless work in front of and behind the scenes. 
Throughout the program, students have demonstrated their talent and potential, and they are well positioned to continue pursuing their academic and professional goals. Students, as you make decisions and plan your careers, I hope you will remember this experience and use what you've learned. And if you decide to attend Florida State University, we will welcome you with open arms as the emerging scholars that you are. Congratulations and best wishes. Thank you. Okay, um, so thank you again to Dean Huckaba for his ongoing support of the Young Scholars Program. So the way this will work, um, each group will have 10 minutes to present their work, and then there will be roughly two minutes for questions. I'll facilitate the questions by monitoring the chat. So if you have a question, please feel free to either type it directly into the chat and I can read it for you as time permits, or you can just type, I have a question, and then I may call on you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to our Open Access Research Seminar Coordinator, John Suter, to introduce our first presenters. Good. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Staling. Uh, so for our first group, our first presentation is actually called Comparing Coastal and Inland Woodlands, Identifying How Temperature Fluctuations and CO2 Concentrations Rates Are Connected to Altitude and Presence of Bodies of Water. And our presenters for this group are Nicholas Kai, Jason Lang, uh, Ashley Pelton, Jeffrey Zhu, and Nishi Antsredi. Okay, so our project was on comparing coastal and inland woodlands, identifying how temperature fluctuations and CO2 concentration rates are connected to altitude and the presence of bodies of water. So we chose this topic based on the availability of open access data and our interest in how environmental factors affect greenhouse gas fluxes and therefore contribute to global warming. So we aim to identify root geographic causes of disparities in temperature and CO2 in climactically comparable regions. So since relevant data was available from NEON, we were interested in how we could apply this data to identifying vulnerable regions for ecological preservation efforts. So a little bit about NEON. NEON collects data on ecological and environmental variables across the United States. One of those being eddy covariance. So eddy covariance is a measurement of how an ecosystem breathes. An eddy is a circular motion of air created by variations in air temperature, and covariance is how two variables vary together. So in this case, we have wind direction and greenhouse gas concentration. So what it does is it measures uh, the gas exchange between soil, vegetation, and air by seeing how many gas molecules pass through a certain volume in a certain amount of time, using wind direction to estimate how many molecules are recurring and calculating how many have left the system. So a couple of previous studies have investigated the relationship between carbon fluxes in aquatic areas, and in particular, the efficiency of eddy covariance methods in observing carbon flux. And this study evaluated that lakes can serve as a significant role as a heat sink and also regulating carbon. For this project, we chose to focus on comparing temperature fluctuations and CO2 concentrations within the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, or SCBI, and the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, or SCRC, field site. Both field sites are in the mid-Atlantic continental United States, explaining why the two sites have comparable climate conditions. The main difference between the field sites are ge geological features. The SCBI site, which is located in Virginia, is characterized by an inland deciduous forest, whereas the SCRC field site is located within a coastal woodlands environment in the state of Maryland. This quality allows for the differentiation between eddy covariance values based on geographical distinctions primarily. As Jason stated earlier, we are aiming to answer the following research question. Are temperature fluctuations and CO2 concentration rates connected to altitude in the presence of bodies of water? In an effort to answer this question, we form the following hypothesis. We believe that over a 12 month period, a difference in temperature values and CO2 concentration rates would be observed between the two field sites due to geological differences, such as the presence of a body of water at the SCRC field site 
and the differences in altitude between the two sites. So how do we go about uh, answering this question? Uh, we first had to download the eddy covariance data from the NEON database, and we did this using the NEON utilities package, which allowed us to download these files as CSV files. And then once we had these files downloaded, we opened them up in uh, Jupyter Notebook in a Python environment. And we had to isolate the CO2 values and the temperature values since eddy covariance is bundled together with a lot of other data sets. And um, we restructured this data by using the pandas package and utilizing data frames. And once we had the uh, data uh, formatted, we, can an we could analyze it. And we analyzed it using two uh, different statistical tests. The first being the independent Walsh T test. Uh, this test shows if um, two data sets, or if the means of two data sets are statistically different. And we also use the uh, Pearson linear regression, which tests to see if uh, two data sets are correlated. And we, we plotted this data using PyPlot in the matplotlib library. Okay, so after performing Welch's test for unequal variances, we obtained the following p-values. So these values are well below the threshold of 0.05 for rejecting the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis being that the sample means are equal. So we can conclude confidently that the sample means between sites are statistically significantly different for triple aspirated air temperature and CO2. Uh, taking a look at our correlation coefficients, we can see that triple aspirated te air temperature between sites is, uh, shows a very high and positive correlation, while CO2 between sites shows no correlation. After aggregating the data in Python and conducting these st statistical tests, we were then able to generate figures that visualize the associations between these variables among the different sites. In figure one, we showed that CO2 concentration fluxes between the SCBI and SCRC sites showed little to no variation, or rather correlation. And this also, this result corroborated with the Pearson correlation coefficient that we calculated previously. Conversely, in figure two, we looked at the triple aspirated air temperatures between the SCBI and SCRC sites. This particular scatter plot shows a strong positive correlation between these two measurements, which also confirms the Pearson correlation coefficient that we calculated earlier. Furthermore, we decided to visualize these data over time in order to detect any patterns, um, any short-term or long-term patterns. Specifically in figure three, we looked at the CO2 concentration fluxes at the two sites between the months of February and December of 2018 where data from NEON was most consistent. SCBI, denoted in green, was shown to be more volatile and very wildly, especially towards the tail end of the year, whereas SERC measurements tended to stay stagnant and consistently minimal throughout the entire year. In figure four, we looked at the triple aspirated air temperatures at both sites. Here, you can see that the both values, although statistically different after conducting the Welsh t-tests, still followed generally the same patterns, where the lowest temperatures were found in, during the winter months and the highest temperatures were found during the summer months. So generally, this also corroborates with the fact uh, with the previous scatter plot that we created, which shows that these temperatures tend to follow similar seasonal variations. The results of the independent Welch T test and Pearson linear regression test showed that the triple aspirated air temperature didn't display relative, like a relatively substantial difference be between sites, but the CO2 concentration flux differed significantly, with the values for the SERC site being relatively lower than the values for the SCBI site. But due to the limitations of our investigation, we cannot say that these results are due to the geological factors that we identified in our research. However, we were able to form a preliminary conclusion. Our hypothesis was partially accepted because the Atlantic Ocean present at the SERC site was capable of acting as a carbon sink and was the reason for the low values of CO2 concentration. 
Although the Atlantic Ocean is also a heat sink, the temperature variable we measured, the triple aspirated air temperature, was measured at too high of an altitude for the ocean to act as a heat sink. This is seen in the image below where the SCBI site tower is 52 meters tall and the SCRC site tower is 62 meters tall. This means that the ocean didn't affect the TAT variable as much as it could have. This preliminary conclusion, however, was based on the analysis of extremely limited data as we were unable to conduct a hands-on investigation and the data we used was too short term for us to accurately investigate climate trends. We suggest that any future research should try to avoid these limitations. Thank you for coming to our presentation. Um, any questions? So thank you so much to this group um, for our first presentation. Just to remind you how we'll do this. Um, first, if you want to use your reaction to give them a round of applause virtually, um, you can select your Zoom reaction. Um, and while you're doing that, if you have a question, please feel free to enter it into the chat um, and I can call on you. It looks like we do have a question from Dr. Dobra Savovic. I'm sorry, I messed that up. Yeah, I'm there, Dr. Savovic. Uh, my question is, uh, since you found that, for example, the body of water, uh, water doesn't make much difference in these particular sites, uh, do you have any ideas uh, on which sites should we take uh, further experimentation to test further this idea? What would be a good location to, to do future studies? Well, for our research, we primarily looked at um, two terrestrial sites that were available in NEON's database. However, um, realistically speaking, there's only um, so many terrestrial sites that exist in that database. Um, if we had the resources available, we would look at different, um, different terrestrial and aquatic sites as well. I think previously we mentioned that we looked at a study that looked at eutrophic lakes and how carbon sinks and uh, heat sinks play a factor into the varying levels of concentration fluxes and temperature levels. But unfortunately, we weren't able to find any sites that uh, had any available eddy covariance data. So if we were to perform future research, that was that would be something that we would look at, extending our uh, our breadth of research to those types of sites. Thank you. Okay, I think we'd have time for one more short question if anyone has another question or a follow-up. Too many screens to look at. Um, I think along the same lines of that question, I have another question. If you you were limited in some to some degree by working with the NEON data, um, if you could set it up from scratch, what would you use the same data set? Would you collect a different type or location or amount of data? How would you do it differently if you could collect the data yourself? Um, I know one thing that I would perhaps do differently is I would maybe keep the same sites, but instead of collecting data on triple aspirated air temperature, since we like can now assume that it's at too high of an altitude for a heat sink to do any difference, I would perhaps like collect temperature that it's like lower to sea level or ground level so we can see if the presence of a heat sink does actually like significantly affect climate trends. Great, thank you. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions from this group. Thank you so much. Um, I turn it back to John Suter to introduce the next group as they get their slides up. Awesome, thank you so much. An awesome presentation. Um, for our next group, we actually have a project titled The Relationship Between Temperature and the Occurrence of Mosquito-Borne Pathogens. Um, and in this group are Vismay Sharon, Christopher McKinney, Lily Baker, Aaron Kang, and Amy Zing. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Aaron, and my partners are Lily, Chris, Amy, and Visme. And we investigated the relationship between temperature and the occurrence of mosquito borne pathogens. So some background information about our topic. 
Uh, the data that we used was from the National Ecological Observatory Network, NEON, and this organization provides data on a, div a, di a diverse range of ecosystems, organisms, and also environmental factors. The way they collected this data, our data, was they had a spatially balanced stratified random design, which essentially they took a piece of land from one of their sites and they picked random points from it and took 10 mosquitoes from each site. Um, and after, and for, and the way they collected it was through every two weeks at core sites and every four weeks at relocable sites. And after collecting the data, they would do data quality checks. The data quality check, they would calculate the percent difference in enumeration, PDE, and the percent taxonomic disagreement, PTD. So PDE basically quantifies the consistency of specimen counts and samples, while PTD quantifies the sample base precision of taxonomic identifications, and the formulas are below. So before delving into our investigation, uh, we looked at previous literature regarding temperature and mosquito-borne pathogens. And most of the research that we looked at had the same overall general conclusion that an increase in temperature leads to an increase in mosquito-borne pathogens, as well as an increase in temperature increases the geographic range of the vectors and as well as it increases the viral replication rates in the host and leads to an increase in transm transmissibility of humans. So based off all of our background research, we decided to investigate the question, how does the temperature of the environment affect the occurrence of mosquito-borne pathogens? Our hypothesis essentially states that these pathogens will occur more often at greater temperatures. This is due to the fact that mosquitoes will increase their breeding and biting above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. We also noted that the rate of transmission may decrease once the thermal optima is reached or passed. The thermal optima is the ideal temperature for biological processes to develop. In our methodology, we first downloaded and analyzed the mosquito-borne pathogen status and summary weather statistics data product. Our study looked at data from two NEON sites with similar environmental conditions and sufficient amounts of data to make comparisons. The Ordway Swisher Biological Station in Florida and the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. The pathogen set in particular included testing results for flavivirus, bunyavirus, and alphavirus groups of mosquitoes. These groups included pathogens for West Nile, Dengue, and Eastern Equine Encephalitis. Only female mosquitoes that were identified to the correct species with an adequate amount based on that species chance of being a vector were actually tested. The testing methods included varicel culture, RT-PCR, and melt curve assays. The weather set included statistical measures on various environmental factors such as wind speed and humidity, but only air temperature was actually analyzed. It was collected by three platinum resistance thermometers and a fan aspirated radiation shield. So in order to create our figures and perform a statistical analysis, we first downloaded the NEON data in Jupyter Notebooks using the NEON Utilities package as shown below in the two figures. We then displayed this data in the form of a line graph using Python and performed the Spearman correlation test to determine whether the, whether the temperature affected the number of mosquitoes that tested positive for a pathogen. We then also performed a regression test to find the value of R. So for our results for the Ordway Switcher Biological Station in Florida, we found that as the months progressed, as shown in Table 1, the number of mosquitoes remained zero, even though the average temperature fluctuated as seen in the temperature mean column. Then to the right, we also see this data graphed in a line graph, and we can see that as the months progress and the temperature fluctuates, the number of mosquitoes still stays at zero. Similar results were found for the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. As months progressed, the number of mosquitoes remained at zero, even though the temperature continued to fluctuate, as shown in the table on the left and the graph on the right. So first, finding our statistical results, we did the same statistical results for our two sites. We used the Spearman correlation test and the regression test. For the Spearman correlation test, we had a p-value of 0 0.05, and the result came out as zero. So that means that there is a strong correlation 
that there was there was a strong correlation that was that there was no correlation between temperature and the number of pathogens found on mosquitoes. Same with the regression test, we tested it and we got a result of y equals zero and r equals zero, which gives us similar ideas compared same to the Spearman correlation test. Conclusion, these results and analysis of the figures do not support our initial hypothesis that there would be a positive correlation between temperature and the number of mosquitoes carrying a certain pathogen. Um, so this suggests that um, in different locations with different temperatures, um, the temperature may not be the cause of different um, results in a different number of mosquitoes having pathogens. But we also have to consider that the samples we collected may not have um, been complete because obviously these are taken from a certain site and they only and a neon only has the resources to do a certain number of tests for pathogens with all these mosquitoes. And also the samples we collected might not have included the species of mosquitoes that are carriers of these different pathogens. So as Chris mentioned, we did um, we analyzed the these mosquitoes for West Nile virus, East Equine encephalitis, and dengue. And but um, although these are carried by mosquitoes and these are found throughout the world, um, it's not necessary that like not all mosquitoes are necessarily carriers of these diseases. So there may be a certain like a decrease in the number of mosquitoes in a certain in the areas that we tested. So. Um, so as Vizme said, the occurrence of pathogens in mosquito species is rare unless we're typically sampling in the epicenter of an outbreak. And so we explored various reasons why that could be. Um, one reason being a mosquito's age impacts the vector com competence. And in some cases, a mosquito that is infected with the virus can experience decreased egg laying, um, decreased survival, and just overall lower fitness and oftentimes certain diseases are adapted to certain mosquito species meaning that like for example malaria can only be treated transmitted by the anaphylesia species of mosquito and so um, and on the flip side um, anaphylesia species of mosquitoes can't transmit things like encephalitis um, furthermore, the dose of the virus that the mosquito ingests can also affect vector competence. So if it's a low virus dose, then the virus takes longer to replicate inside the host. And although past research has shown that warmer temperatures increases the number of mosquito-borne pathogens, um, warmer temperatures may decrease the, the survival rates of the mosquitoes themselves. And also lastly, we spoke to some people at NEON and they are currently exploring more ways to get a more refined resolution for their pathogen data, um, primarily by testing more individuals of certain species that would be carriers of pathogens. So these are our sources. And we'd like to thank NEON for allowing us to use the data of course, and thank you to our mentor, Akash, for helping us through our investigation. And of course, thank you to John and Carlos for all the guidance throughout this course. Great, Any questions? Thank, you. thank you so much. So we can go ahead and do another Zoom clap. Um, and it looks like several people um, are commenting. Do feel free to type a question into the chat or ask a question. Um, so I guess we'll let Vlad go first, if he has another question. Vlad, are you there? Okay, if not, we have a question typed out. Yes, oh. uh, I'm saying that, that, that yeah, I found this very interesting because in the time of COVID, people talked about how viruses could be susceptible to high temperatures or not, and that we in the South here could should be much safer than uh, others, uh, this turns out not to be true. So this type of research is extremely important these days. And here, we, they were apparently not able to find uh, any viruses of the type that they're looking for. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, are there, uh, uh, it was not completely clear to me what kind of pathogens are they looking for? You mentioned a West Nile virus, but is it possible that some of these specific diseases that we're looking for here have been eradicated and they're just not around in the U.S. at this time, or 
or do you think that this is more have to do with a specific detection scheme? I think this has to do with the number of mosquitoes in the sample because these are small samples and we looked at, we, um, we searched up like most of these viruses and most of them are uh, distributed globally and uh, that includes North America, even though they're not common necessarily, they're, um, I think they're still around and they're a big problem for countries in the third world, especially. So I think that ties in with another question we had. Um, was the testing site highly populated, the testing sites that you used? Um, so the testing sites that we used, um, overall, all the testing sites had relatively, um, in terms of the mosquitoes, the number of mosquitoes, there were a lot of um, mosquito species, but the um, number of positively tested mosquitoes um, were little to none. And the specific sites that we looked at, uh, Florida and Tennessee, we assumed before look, going into our investigation that they would have the highest concentration of mosquitoes. And thus we kind of, on that same train of thought, we kind of thought that um, there would be an increased number of mosquito-borne pathogens um, compared to different sites. Great, thank you so much. I think that's all the time we have for questions for this group. Excellent talk again. Um, and I'll turn it over to John to introduce the next group. Awesome, thank you again. And yeah, absolutely, nice work, nice work. Um, so the next presentation that we have up is titled An Analysis of the Photochemical Water Vapor Effect on Photosynthetically Active Radiation. And the group members are Min Lee, Megana Tullery, Nicholas Maldonado, Rohan Davidi, and Mike Zhu. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yeah, we can see it. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rohan, and uh, I, alongside my group members, Min Lee, Megan Atuluri, Mike Zhou, and Nicholas Maldonado, conducted an analysis of the photochemical water vapor effect on photosynthetically active radiation. As we all know, photosynthetic organisms are vital to the ecosystem in the cycling of nutrients and the transformation of energy. These cornerstone organisms are imperative as they alone can utilize the sunlight and harvest this energy to convert carbon dioxide into organic matter. In a time in which the discussion of the implications of atmospheric carbon emissions has become a worldwide conversation of concern, the investigation of factors involved in uh, photos photosynthesis become all the more important. The Environmental Protection Agency estimates that the U.S. force alone were able to offset 12% of gross annual greenhouse emissions from the U.S. in 2019. Photosynthetically active radiation is the light of wavelengths 400 to 700 nanometers utilized for photosynthesis by these organisms. Here in figure one, we can see a graph that was generated by the observation of a single, uh, single chloroplast in which the rate of photosynthesis was measured in the, a number of evolu oxygen evolutions per photon by wavelength. And it's important to note, it, the distribution is not uniform. The photosynthesis rate varies within this range. Previously, urban vegetation and cloud cover have always been the primary considerations for PAR inhibition. However, recent investigations have suggested that water vapor might be a potential cause for atmospheric uh, PAR depletion. These investigations surround a hypothesis that atmospheric water vapor depletes a significant amount of visible light within the PAR range through what are called abiotic photochemical reactions. On the right, you can see such a photochemical reaction demonstrated in which the incoming radiation is depleted by splitting the water vapor molecules. The purpose of our study was to analyze the role of water vapor and its, and its photochemical reactions as a potential depleter of photosynthetically active radiation and, expl and an explanatory variable for disparity between PAR levels from location to location, particularly Como Creek, Colorado and King Creek, Kansas. In this investigation, our group attempted to find if there exists a significant disparity in photosynthetically active radiation at water surface due to differing levels of water vapor. Rooted in recent scientific findings which suggest that water vapor could potentially be a de significant depleter of PAR, our group hypothesized that if we tested for both the correlation coefficient 
representing the relationship between water and PAR in both locations, as well as the significance of the difference in the two sites PAR data, then there will be a strong negative correlation coefficient at both sites and a subsequent significant difference in PAR. We got our data from NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network, which is an organization that collects and publishes ecological data online for public use. The two data sets we used were the relative humidity data set, which re measures relative humidity in um, percent, and it reflects the amount of water vapor in the air at the sites. And the second one we use is also listed on the slide. It measures PAR levels in micromoles per meter squared per second. The two sites we use, as Rohan mentioned earlier, are the Kings Creek site and the Como Creek site because they they're, in the they're in a similar geographic region, so it would reduce some confounding variables. For our statistical analysis, we did Welch's t-test and Pearson's correlation coefficient test. Welch's t-test is a two-sided test that measures how different the expected values between two independent samples are. We did this test to see if there was enough of a disparity between the two sites that we could compare and draw conclusions from. To conduct this test, we first found a t-value using the formula on the screen, and we're looking for a t-value that is less than our p-value of 0 0.05 so that we can reject the null hypothesis that there's no difference between the expected values. We also did the Pearson's correlation coefficient test, which measures the strength of correlation between two variables. We did this test to see how strong the relationship between PIR and water vapor is. Um, to conduct this test, we first have to find an R value using the formula on the screen, and this R value will always be between negative one and one. We are looking for a R value of negative one, though, to indicate a strong negative relationship. For our visual representation, we made two line charts of PAR versus time and water vapor versus time to see if there's any um, climate patterns or any time trends that may have affected the relationship. We also made a scatter plot of PAR versus water vapor to um, model that relationship. And finally, we made maps using Tableau, as Nick will explain later, to see all of this play out in a geographical context. In figure six, as Megana said, a graph was created using Python's matplotlib package to show a visual comparison of the photosynthetically active radiation levels measured in terms of photon flux at both the Como Creek and King Creek neon field sites from September 2017 to August 2018. To thoroughly display the PAR levels at both sites, Python's NumPy package was used to calculate the weekly PAR averages. Looking at the figure, it can be seen that there's an observable disparity in the PAR levels at both the two sites. Adding to what uh, explained, our group utilized Tableau, a data visualization software to generate a map depicting the relative intensities of the mean PAR measurements throughout the duration of our investigation. As shown on the map, the Como Creek and Kings Creek sites are in close geographic proximity to each other with similar latitudes and environments. Despite this, as seen in both figures, the Kings site had a much higher mean PAR during the duration of our investigation. After graphing the two, we used Python in order to find the statistical difference between the two data sets. To begin, we first used SciPy, which is a statistical Python package, and saved the data sets in two different arrays. After, we used stats.pearsonr method in order to find the p-value between the two arrays. As demonstrated in the table, the p-value of the PAR data is approximately 0.00582, or about 0.582%. Uh, a significantly small number. And thus, as a result, we may negate the null hypothesis and say that these two things are statistically different. In figure eight, another graph was created using Python, this time creating a visual comparison of the weekly water vapor levels at both the neon field sites over the same time span as the PAR levels. Looking at the figure, it can be seen that there's a great amount of fluctuation in the water vapor at both sites over the course of the year and that the general water vapor level is approximately the same at both sites. Our second table map also supports what Min just explained. The mean water vapor measurements over the course of our investigation, as shown in the map, are very close to each other. As mentioned previously, the geographic proximity of the two neon sites may have played a role in their similar water vapor measurements. Similar to last time, after graphing the two, we did the same setup using stats.pearson r in order to find the p-value between the two arrays. As demonstrated in the table, the p-value between the water vapor data sets is only 0.00321, a significantly small number, and thus, as a result, we may negate the null hypothesis and say that these two things are statistically different. 
After analyzing the water vapors and PAR data with respect to each other, we then graphed the water vapors and PAR data with respect to each site. We began by importing the PyPlot class from Python. Afterwards, we graphed the scatter plots of data and then used the line of best fit. Using Pearson's correlation test, we found that the R value for the data at the King site was approximately negative 0.413 while the R value at the Como site was approximately 0.205. In investigating the relationship of water vapor effect and photosynthetically active radiation, we found that our results don't in fact support our initial hypothesis of a negative correlation. Despite our recent scientific literature surrounding investigations of PAR loss due to photochemical water vapor effects in North China, our study did not yield results that were consistent with these. To the right, you can see a figure that was developed by the aforementioned study in North China, displaying PAR loss due to photochemical uh, water vapor factors in terms of radiation flux measured in watts per meter squared. However, as anticipated, our research implies that the significance that there is a significant difference between the PAR levels at Como and King Creek. In our investigation of the relationship, we encountered a couple of limitations. As, uh, as the investigation was conducted as an analysis of two separately collected uh, data sets, unlike in a controlled experiment, we were unable to control the confounding variables that may have played a role and interfered with the observation of the water vapor effect exclusively. The, uh, these variables include cloud, vegetation, and urban cover, as well as time of day. Despite the large volume of data, the lack of control in these temporal and positional variables limited the conclusiveness of our study as a whole. For future analyses, it would be valuable to see such a controlled experiment conducted as it would lack these uh, potentially confounding variables and provide an unadulterated depiction of the water vapor effect and PAR. Additionally, it would also be helpful if there was an experiment conducted in which rather than just one or two sites or perhaps three sites, using sites that ranged in latitude could be helpful in determining if there was geographic variations that has led to different relationships between the water vapor effect and PAR. Um, that's uh, th those were our conclusions and these are our sources. Thank you all for listening. A uh, special thank you to uh, uh, Neon, uh, especially Dr. O'Leary, um, uh, our mentor, Dr. Vladimir, um, for giving us so much feedback and John and Carlos as well for the consistent support and uh, help along the way. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, we'll take those now. Thank you so much. Great presentation again. Clap via Zoom. Um, great. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to help facilitate them right now. It would be great to hear from some of our former young scholars that I see in the audience, if anyone's brave out there. Um, while you're working up the courage, I have a question. Um, so tell me a little bit about why relative humidity um, and if how you think that if there's any limitation to using that as a proxy for water vapor. Right, because yeah. you didn't have actual water vapor, you had relative humidity. Do you think your results would be different um, if you factored in temperature? Um, just, do you have any feel for that? Yeah, so um, this was a, a, a consideration as well, because obviously relative humidity varies with temperature and it's expressed as a percentage based on the capacity. Um, originally, we were going to tackle trying to use water vapor data, but the issue is it was bundled and not available for a single usage. And additionally, it wasn't uh, broadly available enough. So that was a limitation that we kind of had to endure along the way. And uh, we agreed that there is a potential, uh, that could be a potential limitation, but we tried to reduce this by um, having uh, selecting two sites that are extremely close in proximity and region in order to try to simulate uh, a similar uh, air capacity for water vapor so that humi the humidity, the relative humidity could be directly uh, compared. Glad to hear you thought of that, that's neat. Um, good answer, thank you. Uh, it looks like Vlad has another question. He wants to unmute himself. The, the uh, something I didn't think about before: uh, the measurements of humidity are done near the surface of the Earth, right? Uh, so you know, I actually have a comment. It's uh, I think it's it's known that the vo uh, vapor uh, or droplets can absorb some forms of radiation, but you'd think that you know. It has to go through a very thick layer of, 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 of the atmosphere, which has humidity. So it may be that there are large variations near the surface of the Earth with time because of winds and other things like this. But maybe, you know, the total amount of absorption 
which is, as the light goes through the entire atmosphere is really not changing very much. That's why I find it intriguing, actually, there is a substantial difference between these, uh, between these two sites. And I wonder, uh, do you think that NEON has any data of vapor pressure or of vapor concentration or humidity higher up in the altitudes? Do you actually see any information of that type? So I believe they do have one. Um, in the previous project, there was an eddy covariance bundle that they were referring to. And I believe they have an H2O storage um, value that they use in, in uh, conjunction with that uh, eddy covariance bundle. The issue is there was two issues with one unwrapping that bundle for our uh, data and as well as the data, it, as it was just one part of an entire bundle, there, we ch when we checked the data, it was not consistent enough for us to actually um, develop anything. But um, the North Chinese uh, study that we were referring to earlier, what they conducted, they actually used sensors that were, at, um, that were higher up to measure the uh, radiation above and below uh, significant layers of the atmosphere. And they subtracted it. So they conducted it with re relationship to the ground. So th that is a consideration they took. And we attempted to do so, but limitations with the data didn't allow us to. I see. Very interesting. I, I, I can see what you, you have given it a lot of thoughts, which is great. So great job. Thank you. I agree. I'm very impressed. It would be nice to have the integrated water vapor in the column, but it seems like you really thought through trying to control what you could with the data you had. Um, so on that note, uh, I'll turn it back over to John for the next group. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so next up, we actually have the relationship between abundant greenhouse gases and macroinvertebrates. And our presenters for this project are Fatima Zman, Alex Gaynor, Iman Khalid, Ty Halpin, and Tanish Vijay Wargira. everyone. My name is Iman and I, alongside my group members, Ty, Tanish, Alex, and Fatima, have decided to study the relationship between abundant greenhouse gases and macroinvertebrates. So a little background is that ever since the Industrial Revolution, pollution levels have been rising and due to that, ocean acidification has also occurred and that it causes the ocean water's pH levels to drop slowly. And so this also occurs in streams due to runoff. And this drop in pH harms the macroinvertebrates by disrupting the homeostasis of them. So their bodies are sensitive to external changes in their environment. And due to that, their exoskeletons can start to come off because of the acidity. So the National Ecological Observatory observation at work, NEON, collects data about gases and their concentration levels and also the macroinvertebrate populations. And we decided to study the site Kings Creek, which is located in Kansas. And it's an aquatic site that is a low level site. And the field ecologists there used infrared gas absorption and a thermal conductivity detector to measure the carbon dioxide counts. And they used a flame ionization detector to measure the methane counts. And so based off that information, we created a research question, which is what is the relationship between dissolved methane and a carbon dioxide in surface water in the population of the Cricotopus species at Kings Creek, Kansas from 2016 to 2019? And on the bottom left of the slide, you will see a carbon dioxide molecule and a methane molecule. From our background research, we were able to form a hypothesis. If the abundance of dissolved methane, CH4, and carbon dioxide, CO2, in surface water is increased, then the population of uh, Cricotibus species at Crinks Creek, Kansas, will decrease because of the negative effects that high concentrations of CH4 and CO2 have on aquatic macroinvertebrate. And to the left, we have a uh, Cricotibus picture. So in our methodology, we have uh, five steps. Step one, uploading and organizing the data. We use the data products, dissolved gases in surface water, and macroinvertebrate collection. Ne NEON has a really neat package called NEON Utilities Package that can be accessed in Python. And we were able to download CSV files for those specific years for the Cricotopus species count and the dissolved gas concentrations. We use Python and R and Pandas to download the CSVs and convert them to data frames, which we, will, we were able to merge and sort. And we converted the, date, the times, the start date times into actual date time objects so that we were able to drop values that were either zero or null, such that we would have more concurrent data that would have fewer, uh, fewer variables for 
a variation. For step two, we visualize the data through matplotlib and ggplot. And we graph the Krakotopus count versus CH4 concentration. We graph the Krakotopus count and versus CO2 concentration as well. And we have three correlation tests, Pearson, Spearman, and Kendall. Uh, my colleague Al Alex will talk more about the graphs. Through the methods previously noted and matplotlib, we created the following two figures that show the population of Krakatopus against the concentration levels of the greenhouse gases CO2 and CH4 in parts per million by volume. Uh, on the left, you can see the population versus carbon dioxide. And it's a pretty scattered plot. And there is a weak to no correlation. If there is a weak correlation, it is positive. And on the right is the CH4 versus population. And it is a pretty, is a weak to moderate correlation that is positive, especially besides the outlier at 7.5 to 50. And now Ty will explain the results of the st statistical tests. The three aforementioned statistical tests were each chosen because of their differing purposes and advantages over each other. The Spearman correlation test is a measure of linear dependence between the two variables. And one drawback from the Pearson correlation is that it is weak to outliers. So looking back at the figures that were previously showed, there is some outliers in both the plots. So we chose to conduct the Spearman and Kendall's tail correlation test also, which are generally regarded as stronger against outliers. And the Spearman correlation is a measure of a monotonic relationship between the two variables as opposed to just linear. So it's more broad for our data. And the Kendall's tail test is a measure of direction and strength of the association of two variables. So it is again more broad and it is also the strongest measure against outliers. And it is also generally regarded as one of the best statistical measures for small data sets such as ours. Tables one and two both contain the statistical values regarding the carbon dioxide concentration and methane concentration with Krakatopus species count. And Tanish will explain the significance of these results. All right, so as Ty mentioned, the six key values we found were actually larger than any reasonable significance level. And this basically means that there's not enough evidence to suggest an association between the gases, carbon dioxide and methane, and the Krakatopus species count. But within our three statistical tests, we did find that methane had a stronger correlation with the Krakatopus species count compared to carbon dioxide. And this was because of the higher correlation coefficient that, was, that we found. Our investigation can be brought into different areas. So we could look at other gases like water vapor and nitrogen gas. We can look at other species such as the orthoclodia species. And we can look um, in other locations, different environments. And these different environments can have different climates, different altitudes, different temperatures, and those variables can all affect the correlation between the gases and the species. So we also had some limitations. The amount of data was much smaller than what we would have preferred. More data could lead to better results and values. And our data could, has, could have also included extraneous variables. And as mentioned before, we only studied one species and but different macroinvertebrate species have different sensitivities to different gases. Um, some may thrive with high levels of methane and others with high levels of oxygen. So in general, we looked into macroinvertebrate species because of their um, importance in aquatic ecosystems, particularly the food chain. So as the rising greenhouse gases um, come from pollution like carbon dioxide and methane, this can cause ocean acidification and Ocean acidification basically reduces the pH levels in the oceans. And as macroinvertebrates are extremely sensitive to um, pH levels, they, they may be harmed. And fishes that prey on these macroinvertebrate species will decline in population as they require nutrients from the macroinvertebrates and, macro, and macroinvertebrates are being harmed by gases. So this in general can affect various businesses or restaurants that depend on the fishes that prey on the macroinvertebrate and can harm the economy negatively. Um, thank you very much for listening and any questions. Thank you so much. We can give another awkward Zoom.
<laughs> round of applause. The silence is deafening. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Again, I would love to hear from a former young scholar. I see a bunch of you out there. Okay, great. Ariana Zai has a question. Go ahead. Um, could you think of any other way to quantify the health of macroinvertebrate other than population? Um, in some cases, I guess we could also analyze certain diseases they, if they could carry, um, but that is much harder as opposed to population count. And especially since NEON didn't have any data on like the diseases they can it contained or anything like that, population count seemed like the best bet. Yeah, population count is definitely more simple and like it directly relates to how healthy they are, I guess, because the lower the population, the worse they come off. Oh, look at this. So many alumni have questions. <laughs> um, okay, we'll go with um, Alex Douglas next. Hi, so you mentioned the extraneous data. Did you have any like examples of variables you thought that might be, or are you just talking about like random noise? Uh, for extraneous data, uh, the NEON data set itself was very small. Uh, that's probably because that NEON would only collect during certain months, and those certain months, like, we're not quite, quite, quite sure how they collected the Cricotibus species, and it's just kind of unclear, and counts weren't always very efficient, especially since, like, they were counted in March, but then they wouldn't count it in December. And that, that's why we try to decrease variance by dropping values that were zero for those certain mo months and correlating only the CO2 values and methane values for only the months that did have cricotopus counts. But we try the best we could in that sense. Great. Okay, one, time for one more question from um, Eunice. And I think I forgot how to say your name. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, I just want to say that, well, first of all, you guys did a really good job. And um, I was just curious as to how, so you picked your dates from 2016 to 2019. And um, if memory serves me correctly, 2019 was a record hot year for, um, for, for, um, for, for, this, for this planet. So how do you think that climate change in particular affected your data and results? Well, thank you, Eunice. And from our results, it shows that they have been generally increasing, but according to many sources and many research papers we've read, it shows that there should be an apparent negative effect. So we're not sure if it was our data or whether there were other external factors. But yeah, that is a very good point. Great. It was really great to hear from some of our previous young scholars right there. Um, so I think we're about out of time, though. So on to the next group. Thank you again. Awesome. So our next group up has the title of Constructing Regression Models by Identifying the Relative Influence of Biotic and Abiotic Factors on Plankton Biomass in the United States. And the group members are Sean Ramesh, Emily Liu, Sabrina Gonzalez, Kaden Moreno, and Abigail Patrick. Okay, yes. So as John just said, our research project is constructing regression models by identifying the relative influence of biotic and abiotic factors on plankton biomass in the U.S. We chose to study phytoplankton because they're the foundation of the aquatic food web. In balanced ecosystems, these microscopic plankton are the food source of many aquatic animals. Also, they drive several chemical for processes forward, such as the carbon cycle. However, if there are too many nutrients available in the water, toxic algae blooms can form. Some of the effects of the algae blooms include producing toxins that can sicken or kill people and create dead zones that lead to the death of underwater plants and aquatic life. Furthermore, bloom die-offs also potentially are destructive to marine life because they cause sharp drops in dissolved oxygen, which marine life needs to survive. Because plankton are so important, and the factors that affect geospatial distribution of plankton are unclear, this project aims to quantitatively explore the relative influence of such factors.
Since plankton is so important to aquatic ecosystems, we decided to further investigate the significance of different variables that could affect plankton biomass. A regression model for plankton biomass would be extremely useful in maintaining the ideal quantity of plankton. The variables that a regression model for plankton biomass should use is still unclear. Since regression models are so sensitive to the quantity of variables used, we explored different regression models to avoid underfitting or overfitting the model. Uh, for our methodology, we first acquired and filtered plankton data from all core aquatic neon sites from 2017 to, to 2020. We then acquired and filtered all available water quality and chemistry data from neon from all core aquatic sites. Next, we aligned all the data by collection date with a 15-day tolerance. Then we ran correlational tests, identified significant variables, and trained regression models based on those variables. These are some of the factors that we analyzed. We've analyzed everything from UV absorbance to dissolved oxygen. The following heat map shows the correlation between different variables. What we are most interested in is the first column, phytoplankton dry mass. We can expand this column into a bar graph. This is the bar graph of the pairwise spearmint correlation for biomass. As you can see, some of these bars are significant, namely sulfate, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, bromine, and TPC. Some of the factors that are significant at the 90% confidence interval are shown above. Many of the variables have correlations that make logical sense. For example, there's turbidity, the measure to which the water loses its transparency. It is higher if there's a greater amount of particles suspended in the water. In this case, the particles suspended are the phytoplankton. The dissolved oxygen has a negative correlation because excessive algae growth can lead to eutrophication, which is when a large body of water becomes covered with plant life. This overabundance of algae and plants uses oxygen to expand and grow while producing lots of carbon dioxide. Another variable is the TBC, which is the total particulate carbon. There's a positive correlation between TBC and phytoplankton biomass because plankton fill their external shells using calcium carbonate. All right, so now that we've identified the significant variables, the next logical step is to actually develop some regression models using them. So one problem we might try to attempt is interpolation. So we have to divide our entire data set into a training and testing data set um, for unbiased accurate, accuracy validation. So we take a random 85% of the data set for training and then use the other 15% for testing. And because we want to figure out whether these regression models are actually performing better with just our significant variables versus using just all of the variables, we make sure to train each model using all variables as a control and then training them only on significant variables. So let's train linear regression, one of the simplest uh, regression strategies. And I mean, it's just horrendous. Uh, the inter it, it's a total failure on, on interpolation. But when we give it only significant variables, we see magnitudes of improvement. But we're not just interested in interpolation, because that's kind of boring. Uh, we're also interested in sequential forecasting, which is what could really be profound in, in terms of plankton biomass. In this case, we train on the first 85%, and we test on the last 15% of the data. And I mean, just with linear regression, we get significant improvements. Now the scale isn't in the 6,000s, but rather in the 2.5s. Uh, and still we see that when we use significant variables, uh, we get better accuracies. But linear regression is pretty simple. Um, and we can definitely do better than this. Because it's so important to be comprehensive when we're tackling such a problem of this massive broad scope, uh, we use several different machine learning and regression strategies. So we use stuff like lasso, ridge, elastic net linear regression, which are sort of natural improvements from ordinary least squares linear regression. But we also use some interesting machine learning strategies like support vector machine regression, decision trees, and neural networks that can capture some very interesting complex nonlinear relationships. And what's really fascinating is that when we train this on a random interpolation problem, every model performs better using significant variables. And we see the exact same thing on the, on the extrapolation problem. When we give it all 44 variables that we studied, it doesn't perform as well as when we gave it only five variables. Um, so this is a sign that we really chose our models quite well. So in summary, um, decision trees perform best on the interpolation problem with a 66% error. 
ridge regression performed best on the extrapolation problem with 79% error. And these are really quite poor, to be quite honest. Uh, and there are several reasons for why this might be the case. First, plankton biomass might just follow more complex patterns. We might not have studied enough variables, despite our best effort, to capture all the patterns um, that, that plankton biomass follow. We might have had insufficient data, and this is especially uh, harms models like the neural network, which really depends on large quantities of data to learn. It also might have been too large of a scope for accurate regressions. When we're trying to look for generalizable correlations, it's good to have this broad scope, you know, studying every site in the US, I mean, across several different latitudes, uh, using all core sites. But when we're looking for accurate regressions, um, trying to get models that are really precise and accurate, uh, this scope might have been too large. We might have seen better results picking one or two sites and designing regression models for that. There are also some limitations in, in, in the study as a whole. Namely, Spearman's correlation is suboptimal. Some variables like water temperature are obviously not monotonic, which is an assumption for Spearman's. Plus, the data isn't really ordinal here, uh, so rank-based correlation will be pretty weak. There are a couple of alternatives to using Spearman's like we did for feature selection. The best option is to take the best performing models, so decision trees and ridge regression, and compute sensitivity analysis. So which factors mattered the most to the model when it was making its predictions? Uh, and this might be a better feature selection strategy. The best optimal strategy is really just to compute all the combinations of variables for every model for every problem. Uh, but this requires training like 50 trillion models. Uh, and so it quickly escapes the realm of, impractica uh, of practicality really, really fast. So there's a couple of implications as a result of this research. First, this clarifies the quantitative importance of a wide variety of factors on plankton. So it reveals how delicate the marine ecosystem can be, exemplifying the importance of being cautious with the environment, and as an extension, how difficult it can be to return balance to plankton health and biomass. Furthermore, um, this just facilitates good variable selection for regression models. Uh, and this could predict and allow for the proactive mitigation of harmful plankton blooms. Uh, so we'd be able to forecast eutrophication before it happens uh, and make changes uh, to the way we treat these lakes uh, or, or water bodies before they actually happen, which is incredibly profound. We could also predict general declines in plankton health. Uh, and because plankton are such an important part of our ecosystems, uh, in, at the bottom of the food chain and in the carbon cycle as a whole because they act as carbon sinks. Uh, it's really important to be able to track and forecast uh, what, what's happening to these critical organisms in, in, in our water bodies and, perha and perhaps um, take action before, uh, before it's too late. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to thank our mentor, Beth Stroop and Neon for their really high quality data that's, that was a joy to work with. And using these results, uh, we wrote a paper, which you can access in the following link. Uh, we'd really love to hear your feedback on this project. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very impressive. Clap. <laughs> um, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, okay, I found this fascinating. I have a question. Um, have you, did you happen to look at any you're talking about potentially predicting um, like large plankton blooms. Had you looked at any historic events to see like how your model might be able to do? Did you do any like hind casting, hold something out and see? Um, is that something you might do? Um, so first of all, the plankton, uh, the plankton data that we use only extends to 2017. So we literally chose the maximum amount of data we could, all sites possible for all dates. And in fact, there was a small spike uh, towards the end of 2019. And we actually included this in the extrapolation problem. We used the first 85% to train and the last 15% to test. And this 15% actually did contain one outlier. Um, and so that was included in the results. I don't think that the model, that the regression models were actually able to predict that outlier. Um, but this is because of the limitations that we, that we outlined at the end of our presentation. Interesting. These models are really just like starting points for now. We've, I, we're just at the beginning of identifying which variables matter, and this is totally novel. Uh, so it's kind of expected that the first regression models we make are going to be pretty horrendous. 
Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Uh, looks like we have another question from Vlad. Yes, very interesting topic. And uh, I was wondering, you mentioned that uh, the data that were available to you only extended to 2017. Uh, so there are only three years of data. There is rather a few data points. Uh, do you actually happen to know why? I mean, I would have thought, I mean, this is out of my, I'm out of my depth. I'm not a biologist, but how come they didn't, you know, have such studies many, many decades ago? Are, are, is this just a completely new line of research or or, or, or just this data, NEON database is limited to the very recent data. What's the reason for this? So um, there are several things that are novel about this project specifically. First, we study interior um, water sources because we are using NEON data and NEON is the National Ecological Observatory Network. Um, although several studies in the past have studied, for example, the correlation of just iron concentrations, to plankton biomass or eutrophication in lakes, we there's no real research in the existing literature that we've seen um, that sort of ranks these, like, that ranks a wide variety of variables to one variable, plankton biomass, to figure out which ones are more important. And this is really a critical question to ask when we're designing regression models, um, which is why we are doing the study now. And uh, I think the reason why it hasn't been done before is because in order to do this kind of study, you have to have a consolidated database of both plankton biomass and all of these 44 different chemistry and water quality variables for the same lakes, for the same areas collected at the same time. And that's really only possible with NEON. I see, very impressive. You know, I also have a question. You know, I'm, I actually happen to do statistical physics. Uh, the, the amount of data that's available in these research areas, which are very important, it seems to be still very small. So, you know, one may wonder how reliable are, or one can also make some estimates of errors in various regression coefficients and things like this. And, you know, you mentioned the, the, the neural networks and things like this. And my impression is that these tools are generally very useful when you have a lot of data and, and we have very few data. Yeah. It's, it's, it seems that, you know, using these, these layers of neural networks that you so, so is, I mean, what's your feeling, I mean, about that? I mean, is there anything useful that can be learned from, from these fancy new methods of analysis? Yeah, absolutely. So you're 100% you're correct that neural networks are extremely suboptimal for this problem when data is really only collected uh, three times a year for plankton biomass. Uh, but so the reason that I use the neural networks here is that uh, although they're almost certainly going to overfit on this data because there's so little data and so much complexity in the model, when we go back and compute the sensitivity analysis on that neural network, we can figure out which variables mattered most to the neural network as it's making these terrible predictions. And that could be important in choosing good feature selection for future regression models. Uh, I think that in ecological and environmental science as a whole, there's a lot of good data, um, but not a lot of people who are able to use these advanced machine learning techniques uh, and that's sort of where our project steps in. Very much true, yes. Excellent work. Thank you very much. Thank you. I love that answer, and I hate to cut this off because I find it fascinating. Um, I definitely, I'm always a skeptic of neural networks, but I think you really summed up how they can be useful when you're looking at phenomenologically where they point you um, to look at other things. But unfortunately, we have to move on to another group. I'm sorry to the other people who had questions. It looks like they did post their paper if you want to Maybe it's a good time to also plug SciTeens. Um, if you would like to provide further feedback to our students, we'd be happy to hook you up with SciTeens accounts where you can do some asynchronous mentorship online for some of our faculty members who might be interested in that. Okay, but I will pass it back off to John. Yeah, thank you so much for that, um, Erica. And yeah, if you have any questions after this, feel free to email me. Um, I'll provide my email after this, but in the spirit of time, we'll move on to the next uh, presentation now. And the title of this presentation is The Relationship Between Water Quality and Epiphyton Area Density. And our presenters for this talk are Gatlin Kolb, Isabella Zmerska, Ardi Kalamangalam, Lian Zhu, and Hannah Skaglun. See my screen all right? Great, sweet. All right, so as uh, John mentioned, our group decided to study the relationship between water quality and epiphyte and area density. So a uh, little bit of background. So epiphyton are essentially microalgae that grow on the surface of plants. 
And so we learned from Brown's paper in 2009 that epiphyton um, is one of the primary food sources in the ecosystems that they live in. So they are sensitive to the changes in the environment, so they can be an indicator for environmental quality factors such as phosphorus, nitrogen, or pH. Uh, next, we also found uh, Wright Semma et al's paper from 2018, which displayed similar data that involves atmospheric conditions affecting the acidity of smaller aquatic ecosystems, which are correlated with atmospheric CO2. Specifically, an increase in atmospheric CO2 corresponds with a decrease in pH or an increase in acidity. This emphasizes uh, how photosynthesizing organisms are important for balancing out these decreases in pH. Lastly, the Ordway Swisher Biological Station, ran by the National Ecological Observatory Network, or NEON, contains two lakes that are studied, Lake Suggs and Lake Barco. They are very close to one another, um, but they are also vastly different. More on those later. Okay, so this is a little ecology lesson to see where our research question comes into play. As Gatlin said, epiphyton are essentially photosynthetic microorganisms such as diatoms and phytoplankton. And they are really significant to ecosystems because whatever happens to them happens to everyone else. And this is mainly because they are the base of the food web. They are the primary producers. So if you have too little of them, then there's no food for herbivores and there's no oxygen for aerobes. But if you have too much, you could have harmful algae blooms, which can kill higher trophic levels. So the two variables that we were interested in were oxygen and pH. We measured oxygen because it's a product of photosynthesis. It shows the overall photosynthetic activity, indicating overall epiphyton health and the overall water quality. We also measured pH because pH is something that's important in all biochemical systems and it implies, has implications to um, the homeostatic ability of these epiphyton. So we wanted to see how these two factors come into play in epiphyton density and if there are any limiting factors with that. So with all of that in mind, that leads us into our research question, which was, how does dissolved oxygen concentration and pH affect the area density of epiphyton growing in Lake Suggs and Lake Barker? Our hypothesis for this was that as the area density of epiphyton increases, both pH and dissolved O2 concentration will also increase. So as far as the methods that we used in order to investigate this, um, as Gatlin previously mentioned, we utilized the Ordway Swisher Biological Station, which included two lakes, Lake Suggs and Lake Barco. They are about 1,500 meters away from each other. Lake Suggs is larger than Lake Barco in surface area, but Lake Barco is deeper than Lake Suggs, which results in two very unique lakes that we can compare and contrast really easily. Each lake is divided into 10 what are called riparian folds, which essentially, if you just look at the figure, it's the, it's the sections outlined in red. So the, data, the scientists get data samples from five non-adjacent riparian sections. So either the odd numbers, one, three, five, seven, and nine, or the even ones, two, four, six, eight, and 10, every time they collect data. That's why each lake is analyzed as two non-adjacent riparian sections, rather than the lake just as a whole. It wouldn't really be valid to compare the biomass of samples in between riparian sections, because even a single lake can have so many different unique microbiomes. So data that we're using to calculate area density are the ash-free dry masses of epiphyton, as well as the surface area of the plants that the epiphyton is collected from. So this data is collected three times per year, roughly in the spring, summer, and fall. The variables from the water quality data set that we're using are pH and dissolved O2 concentration, as we previously mentioned. And we used um, the largest scope of the data that we could, which was November 2017 until February 2020. We heavily utilized the neon readings, as well as Excel, to look up explanations for all the variables included in the data sets and hide the ones that we didn't need in order to focus on the ones that we did. And then lastly, we used various libraries in Python to plot and visualize our data. Now we'll look at our results and analysis to explore the true relationship between epiphyton area density with oxygen and pH.
So the first figure on the left is a scatter plot of the dissolved oxygen concentration measurements taken from 2018 to 2020 for Lake Barco. And on the right is a similar scatter plot of dissolved oxygen measurements from 2018 to 2020 for Lake Sucks. To confirm whether the lakes had different environments, we took an independent samples t-test to analyze them separately. An independent samples t-test tests for differences between two samples based on the same continuous variable. For this t-test, we first took a t-test based on the dissolved oxygen concentration at bark and sludge sites, which gave us a p-value of 0, 0.0, thus indicating that we can reject the null hypothesis that the distribution of the average dissolved oxygen concentrations is the same at both sites. Um, these figures are similar to the oxygen figures, and so they show the pH levels taken at Lake Bargo and Suggs during the months from 2018 to 2020. Similar to oxygen, we took an independent samples t-test based on the pH levels at the lakes, which also gave us a p-value of 0, 0.0, so we can again reject the null hypothesis that the distribution of the average pH is the same at both sites. With this, we can make the conclusion that the differing environmental variables at Bark and Sug act as confounding variables in the research and therefore can account for some of the variation in the dry mass density of epiphyter. The next four slides will be explained and summarized later. As mentioned before, Lake Fargo and Suggs were analyzed as two separate groups of riparian points because the odd numbered and the even numbered points were separately sampled on different set of dates. However, the groups from the same lake appear to share the same general trends. The graphs here show that density and dissolved oxygen have a strong inverse relationship at Lake Barco, but they have a strong direct relationship at Lake Suggs. As for pH, the area density of epiphyton and pH have a direct relationship at Lake Barco and also a direct relationship at Lake Suggs. Summary and analysis. For Lake Barco, the negative correlation coefficients between area density of epiphyton and dissolved oxygen content suggest that as there was more epiphyton growing in the lake, there was less oxygen in the water. This is surprising because epiphyton photosynthesize, which means they produce oxygen. However, on Lake Suggs, there was a positive correlation between those variables, contradicting the findings from Lake Barco. For pH, on both Lake Barco and Lake Suggs, there was a strong positive correlation between area density of epiphyton and pH. So as there was more epiphyton, the pH of the water increased, which makes sense because removing carbon dioxide from the air in the water through photosynthesis means that the water becomes less acidic, raising the pH. So in summary, as the area density of epiphyton increases, the pH also increases. However, we are still inconclusive about the relationship between epiphyton and the dissolved O2 concentration since the outcomes at the two different lakes were different. A few limitations of our project include a missing data point because of faulty measurement of the ash-free biomass on one of the dates. Um, we're also missing other environmental factors that could have affected our data, so confounding variables. And we think that we could further explore this with other bodies of water since we don't have a very good generalization looking at only the two sites. Here are our references. And we'd like to thank our mentors, John Sudo, Carlos Mercado Lara, and Wei Yang, and our researchers from NEON that made it possible, Stephanie Parker and Donald O'Leary. Any questions? Thank you so much. Again, I'll take questions from the chat um, while we applaud. I'd love to hear from former students again if they're interested. That's been fun. And if we don't get a question from the audience, I'm happy to take a question from one of our current students too. Okay, the one time I'm not prepared with my own question. <laughs> Just, okay, here's a question. Um, so what are some of the implications of this study? Uh, 
I think that, um, for example, with uh, the PH, like we saw earlier, um, there was a direct uh, relationship between the increase in pH and the density, uh, the area density of the epiphyton. And I think that uh, studying how the pH in an environment is increasing or decreasing can be a good indicator of where the epiphyton and therefore the rest of the ecosystem is falling since epiphyton is a good indicator for the rest of the ecosystem. Um, what I mean by that is uh, there can be environmental factors that uh, affect the pH. For example, over here, we had a very weird data point that we actually had to look up um, involving a sensor error. However, we also learned that uh, due to some weather around the state that this was collected, we also learned about something called the acid mine drain. So acid mines can essentially happen when rock, uh, like acidic rock is eroded due to different weather patterns or human activity. So I think that uh, by looking at different changes in pH, we can also use those changes in order to point toward uh, the direction of the ecos ecosystem. Wait, okay. Sorry, could I add on to that? Yeah, sure. So um, also, even though it's not direct, this does have some implications to climate change because um, small critters, especially microorganisms like epiphyton and phytoplankton are so important to maintaining homeostasis in the ecosystem. So understanding how factors that are influenced by climate change, such as pH and dissolved oxygen, affect these microorganisms is really important to understand what these ecosystems might look like in the future. Great, we do have one more question um, from Dr. Miller. Sometimes as epiphyton goes up, they also die more, more increasing bacteria, which can use up O2. Could this explain the difference between your lakes? Um, as mentioned before, we only studied pH and oxygen concentration levels, but these two lakes are uh, vastly different and they are categorized differently too, I think. So, um, possibly. And also, um, there's different organisms growing in and around the lakes. Great, thank you so much for another excellent presentation. And um, we're ready to move on to the next group. Awesome. So next up we have the project titled The Effect of Algae Populations on the Chemical Properties of Water. Um, and this project was actually conducted by Alex Hu, uh, Kaylin Myers, David Wu, Grace Jing, and Om Parkett. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am David Liu. I'm on Parikh. I'm Grace Yan. I'm Alex Yu. I'm Kaylin Myers. And our group conducted a project on the effect of al algae populations on the chemical properties of water. So, um, as many of you may have heard, uh, algae growth uh, has become recently a pertinent issue, especially in the Southeast and in Florida. Um, algae plays a large role in aquatic ecosystems and climate change has been affecting ecosystems worldwide and the way that they function. Um, one function of algae is that it can fixate carbon, which benefits other organisms by providing um, them with organic molecules. And under these, under these conditions, analyzing how algae affects its ecosystems uh, can give insight to the future conditions since populations of algae are on the rise. Um, and in our project specifically, chemical changes uh, should be observed as physical changes are often a result of the chemical changes seen in their environment. Uh, so based on that background, uh, we determined our research question to be, what is the relationship between algae populations in Florida and the chemical conditions in their ecosystem? And based on some background research, uh, we determined our hypothesis to be um, in a given ecosystem, if algae populations increase, then the carbon levels will fluctuate while nitrogen levels will increase. Um, and this is because of algae's role in carbon fixation, which facilitates the growth of other organisms in their ecosystems. 
So for our methodology, we processed all of our data in Jupyter Notebooks. Um, first, we imported a few modules, RPy2, Pandas, NumPy, and others. And this aided us in our data processing. Two data sets were used, one which recorded the clip harvest in biomass of algae, and therefore told us about the population of algae at these sites, and the other which detailed the chemical properties of surface water in which the algae was found. The two data sites we used were Barco Lake and Suggs Lake, which are both located in Florida. Those are the only two data sites in Florida for which NEON, or the National Ecological Observatory Network, collects data related to algae. Uh, back to data processing, we differentiated our data frames in terms of site ID, aka where the data was collected, and the analyte collected. This included carbon, nitrogen, and certain isotopes of carbon and nitrogen. Lastly, we exported our data frames as Excel files so that we could use them in Tableau, which is an artificial intelligence powered data processing and figure creating software. And we conducted statistical tests. The statistical tests that we conducted were the Spearman correlation test and the Kendall Tau correlation test. Both tests are similar in that they show in, that they demonstrate the relationship between monotonic relationships. However, the Kendall Tau test has stricter confidence intervals and is therefore sometimes a more accurate measure of correlation. Below are our results for the correlation tests. As you can see, algae populations, algae population has a pretty significant correlation with nitrogen levels, carbon 13 levels, and carbon and nitrogen 15 levels. So as you can see, um, over here, figures 1.1 and 1.2 depict the algae population data at the Barco Lake and Shooks Lake sites, respectively. Um, they are to show a visualization of the neon algae data that we analyzed and compared to the chemical factor data. Um, you can also see that there's only three points for each graph on the figures. And that's because for the data set that we used that contained the algae dry mass, the data was only collected one day a year, but it was collected at multiple locations within the same site. Uh, so our algae population was plotted as median values of the collected locations within the two lakes um, on the days of collection from the last three years. And it includes the algae aerial dry mass and aerial ash-free dry mass. And what aerial means is that it's just the dry mass per unit area. So in this case, the measurements were in the units grams per meter squared. Um, we took median measurements to account for any outliers that might have occurred in the data. The dry mass just means it's dried algae, and the ash-free dry mass is a dry mass combusted until only inorganic components remain. And then the weight of the inorganic components is then subtracted from the original dry mass. So you get the mass of only the organic components. So here we have two figures, which are 3D simulations utilizing the Blender software that model situations we normally don't have opportunities to sit and watch in real life. Figure 2.1 models the patterns of algae population based off of average dry ashless algae weight data from the bark slash sig sites. It also features projections for the dry ashless weight of algae in the next two years, which are calculated by averaging rates of change between data points since the data points fluctuate. Figure 2.2 is calculated the same way which displays the fluctuating averages of nitrogen concentration in the water at the bark slash sig sites. Accuracy was confirmed as the projections reflect the same results of the two statistical tests that were conducted, which show a weak negative correlation between the algae population and the nitrogen concentration. So now we can go ahead and view figures 2.1 and 2.2. So once again, these animations reflect a weak negative correlation between algae population and nitrogen concentration, which is the results that our statistical test got. Um, so limitations of our research. The first limitation was that we utilized data collected from NEON only from 2017 to 2019, so a, a range of three years. Uh, and we would have preferred to use a, a larger time range, which would allow stronger correlations to be drawn. Uh, the second limitation was inconsistent reporting and results. 
So some data was missing specifically for the SUG site. And this led to us not being able to uh, conduct statistical tests for the site. And as mentioned for the available data, um, it was only collected once a year. Um, the third limitation was geographical scope of research. So our inquiry was limited to Florida. So um, in other locations outside of Florida where the ecosystems might differ slightly, uh, there could be other confounding variables that would lead to us not being able to generalize our results to every ecosystem with algae. And our conclusion. So our hypothesis regarding chemical concentrations was partially accurate. The part about carbon levels and carbon 13 levels fluctuating was uh, supported by research since we obtained relatively low negative correlations between carbon levels and algae populations. Um, but, but for the part about nitrogen levels, we predicted that nitrogen levels would create a positive correlation between with uh, algae populations, but we actually obtained a moderately negative correlation between nitrogen, nitrogen 15 levels and uh, algae populations. And these are our references. Uh, thank you for listening to our presentation. And does anyone have any questions? Thank you so much. Another great presentation, our second to last presentation. Thank you to everyone who's been holding on so long. Um, we're so impressed with the numbers we've had today and the interest um, you've all shown. So we do have some time for a couple of questions before our last presentation. I love again to hear from some former students. That was fun. I assume you're all typing very insightful questions right now. <laughs> so I'll give you another second. Um. Okay, maybe, I think everyone's getting a little Zoom fatigue. We maybe should have built a break into this. I don't think it's you guys. I think it's um, the venue. Um, so let's see, if you were to continue this work, do you have any idea what would be your next step? Oh, look, someone else asked that same question. <laughs> uh, yeah, 100%. Um, obviously, we try to expand the scope of our research. Um, maybe instead of just including sites from Florida, we can include multiple sites nationwide, as Alex mentioned. Uh, furthermore, if we were able to conduct research independently, we would probably try to gather our own data and try to fill in some of the holes that were present in our research. And we might also measure the chemical concentrations of a few more chemicals. Um, we were we were limited to carbon, nitrogen, and certain isotopes of carbon and nitrogen, but we might expand that to oxygen, um, phosphorus, or other elements. So, what would that help you accomplish? What um, what kind of things? Maybe also just what? Why did you pick this topic, and why are the results important? So, um, as you may know. Uh, Algae are an important part of aquatic ecosystems because they're the primary producers. Um, they're one of the only organisms in these ecosystems that produce their own energy, and therefore other organisms rely on them to take energy from the sunlight, convert it into biological molecules, so that those other organisms may, those other organisms may then consume algae in order to gain their nutrition. So this is important because they're basically the backbone of these um, ecosystems, and studying the chemical concentrations of these ecosystems would give us further insight into the interactions between organisms and perhaps some trends that are occurring due to recent um, issues such as global warming and uh, algae blooms. Cool. So one last question from Cynthia Wong. Why did you include other isotopes of carbon and nitrogen? Um, these were present in our data and they're also pretty important. Uh, the carbon-13 the carbon isotope um, gives us insight into the chemical interactions of algae themselves because algae produce carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 is important because nitrogen-15 is mainly a result of runoff from farms nearby. So that could give us insight into perhaps um, factors that humans may be contributing to that may be changing ecosystems in these, um, in these areas, specifically in Florida. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so we have one more presentation left, not but 
uh, last but not least, um, and I'll let John introduce. All right, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so as Erica said, last but not least, our final presentation for today is the effect of climate variations on mosquito species distributions at the Ordway Swisher Biological Station. Uh, and so our presenters for this project are Anjali Vabulmudi, um, Drew Patel, Sierra Stocker, Katerina Nikiforova, and Robert DiMartino. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming and staying to the last presentation. Um, our presentation is on the effects of climate variations on mosquito species distribution at the Ordway Swisher Biological Station. So some background on this topic is that previous research has shown that there's a link between climate change and mosquito population size. So typically, mosquito populations are able to thrive in warm and humid weather. So historically, they've been limited to more tropical, more tropical regions. Um, however, because of climate change and um, the general climate warming, places that were previously uninhabitable to mosquitoes because of their um, low average temperatures, um, their temperatures are rising. So mosquitoes will have a greater amount of territory to be able to grow their populations in. So overall, mosquito um, populations, their numbers are expected to increase in the future. Um, and the reason why it's so important to study trends in mosquito populations is to help predict um, and prevent mosquito-borne disease outbreaks. So according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, mosquitoes are the animal that cause the most human deaths per year. And the reason for this is because um, they are able to transmit diseases to human beings. Um, so it's very important for us to understand trends um, generally among mosquito populations and also to specifically um, break these trends down by mosquito species because some species are more resistant to weather changes than others. So all of this background information brings us to our research question, which is how have climate variations affected the mosquito species distribution at the Ordway Swisher Biological Station in Florida? Our initial answer to this question, our hypothesis was that if there's an increase in average temperature and humidity, there's gonna be a corresponding increase in the mosquito population of the species under the genus Aedes because this species tends to thrive more in a tropical environment while a corresponding decrease in temperature should result in a decrease in the proportion of this genus in the overall population. However, as you'll soon see, the data did show a different story. So within our methodology, our general strategy was to analyze climate and mosquito population data from the National Ecological Observatory Network, or NEON. And the data that we used was from the Central Florida site, as we've said, the Ordway Swisher Biological Station. The specific data products that we used were mosquitoes sampled from carbon dioxide traps and summary weather statistics from 2017 to 2019. So our first step was to collect the data from the NEON um, station and then use a Jupyter notebook to compile the data using the NEON utilities package into a Python readable table. Our next step was to produce figures based on our compiled data and we did this in a variety of ways. We used line charts to estimate species numbers over time, as well as their changes in relation to one another. We created another set of line charts with the date and time as the x-axis and the weather variables displayed on the y-axis. And in our final step, we conducted statistical analysis to confirm the relationships between the data. And we did this by creating additional bar graphs to display the correlation coefficients and we also conducted chi-squared testing to determine whether there was actually a statistically significant relationship between mosquito species patterns and weather data. So moving on to our figures, our first figure displays the number of mosquitoes sampled for the four most abundant species at the Ordway Swisher station. And the numbers are an average of each month so the data points represent the average number of mosquitoes collected in a certain month every year. And it's notable to notice that most species see a population increase in the summer, but the blue line, Anopheles crucians, actually sees a population increase in the winter. 
And as we'll discuss later, this is likely due to interspecies competition. Okay, moving on to figure two. In this one, we are comparing the weather characteristics with the total mosquito population throughout the three years in an average of each month. And we see that sunlight is um, fluctuating with a drastic decrease during the um, winter months, and it has an increase during the summer, which is um, seen by short radiation mean. And um, the relative humidity and precipitation follow an inverse pattern in that they are increasing during the winter months and decreasing during the summer. And um, the mosquito population is fluctuating with um, a drastic increase during the summer. And in figure three, we look at each um, species with the four most abundant mosquito species. And we see that there is a peak of or an increase of C. nigropalpus during the 2017 summer and an increase of C. erraticus during the summer of 2018 and an increase of C. protubans during the summer of 2019. And you'll also see that A. crucians have an increase when the other species are decreasing in rates, which is during the winter months. So we also did correlation testing between um, the different weather variables and the top six mosquito species. And as you can see from this uh, correlation coefficient graph, different mosquitoes have different correlation coefficients with different weather variables, which implies that different, uh, rate, different mosquito species will increase or decrease at different rates depending on or uh, in correlation to how weather variables change it change. And it's also notable to see that different mosquito species have negative correlations to weather variables that would generally cause an increase in mosquito species. And this supports the interspecies competition hypothesis because as um, mosquito species, for example, during the winter decrease because of the colder temperatures, some will actually increase because there's less competition between the mosquito species, but yet they're more resistant to the cold. And this graph shows the number of mosquito species most strongly correlated to each weather variable for the top six species. And this essentially just it supports what was on the previous slide that different mosquito species will be um, affected differently by different weather variables and thus the proportions of species will change in accordance to that. And we also performed a chi-square sig significance test of independence between the weather, weather variables and mosquito population patterns and due to the large amount of data the p-values were all very small and this signifies that the significance was that the results were significant and that there was an, in fact a dependent relationship between the variables. And this means that um, the mosquitoes will likely fluctuate according to the weather patterns. So in conclusion, these climate variations do tend to have a strong correlation with mosquito populations. The most common ones we not noticed were triple aspirated air temperature. So one thing that our results did show that we weren't initially looking for, but it's a good observation, the, there's a level of interspecies competition. Once, one species that shows this is the Acrucians. I believe this is the one that in the winter, while all the other species had decreased populations because they're less resistant to temperature changes, this species actually thrived during that time. So the hypothesis was not conclusively accepted or rejected, mainly because the data did show a different picture than what we were initially trying to address. So some of the limitations with this would be the scope and correlation of the data. We only looked at one site and a couple year time period. However, if we wanted to make this more, more of a generalized conclusion, we would be able to look at other sites. I'd, so that's all for this presentation. I wanna thank John and Carlos, our research mentor, Dr. Miller and Neon for providing this data for us to work with. Any questions? That concludes our last presentation, yay. Um, Okay, so again, we can take questions from the chat. It looks like we have a few different. How about Shrieker, one of our former students? Hello. So um, you guys said that you couldn't conclusively accept your 
hypothesis because your data didn't exactly match what you were trying to study. So in the future, like what changes would you make to find data or adapt this data to actually uh, see how it can answer your hypothesis? That's actually a great question, Shrikir. One thing we would do differently is I suppose look at the data beforehand, see exactly what it addresses, what species it's is contained, what it has information about, and then develop the research question and a hypothesis so that we could better address an overall, there'd be more continuity in the research. All right. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. Um, one from Dr. Tom Miller, who asks, most people would think that precipitation would be the most important factor. We always are told to get rid of standing water in our yard, et cetera. So why do you think all your species didn't significantly vary with precipitation? Um, I can actually answer this question. Um, I don't think that it didn't significantly vary precip precipitation. I think that mosquito species did vary and our results did show this, except that uh, factors like temperature and humidity vary uh, were more strongly correlated with this. And I think that's simply because all of those variables are so interconnected. You know, humidity depends so heavily on precipitation and it also depends so heavily on temperature that um, the results can kind of get mixed up. And that doesn't mean that precipitation doesn't strongly affect um, mosquitoes or it doesn't strongly correlate with the level of mosquitoes. It just means that um, other variables that are also correlated with precipitation might just affect it more strongly. And I would also like to point out a lot of these weather variables also connect with each other in terms of we're going to get hotter summers and more rain at the same time around June, July. So a lot of these things happen at the same time. They kind of overlap on each other. Great. Anything else? No? Perfect. <laughs> um, so I think that's about all the time we have for questions. Um, thank you again to all of our students. This really took some stamina. I'm impressed with the groups that held on to the end and all of you who have stayed with us through to the end. Um, that's all we have for the presentations, but I'd like to turn it over to my co-director, Barbara Shoplock, to make a couple of closing remarks. I'm making sure I'm not muted. I'm not muted. And that's, it, I probably should be because I'm like, I'm ready to yell. I want to clap so loudly. You all were so amazing and impressive. So if the people who are not the young scholars, if you would hit that space bar and just actually give them a round of applause, because that was incredible. So let's just hear a little bit in the clap world. Film is such a strange format. I guess you can't clap and hold the space bar, right? <laughs> um, but so to the young scholars that are out there right now, um, I would like to say to you, um, thank you. You tirelessly pushed yourself further than I think even you admittedly knew you could this summer. And you did it, and you did it, and you did it through to the end. Um, you've truly displayed the noble and collaborative side of science, the teamwork that you brought throughout these six weeks. Um, and you're without a doubt better consumers of science for pushing yourself through this experience right to the end. Very, very, very impressed. And I have to say your essays on what I did this crazy COVID summer are going to be some of the best to read. So pat yourself on the back. This I'm, I'm excited. Can you tell? I'm shaking. I'm excited. Um, before we go closing remarks, I would also, in addition to acknowledging your tremendous effort from taking numbers that someone else collected and turning it into something that you could talk about and own and see future research into, I would also like to acknowledge my, um, my co-director, my colleague, Dr. Erica Staling. Um, she brings a lot of expertise, both as a scientist and as an educator. And these definitely, the input from her vastly improved this 38th iteration of the Young Scholars Program. Um, and this year's success, Eric, I'm looking right at you, is directly, is directly due to your involvement. So thank you for that. And Dr. Stanley and myself, we're aware that we invited you to a two hour Zoom on a Friday afternoon. So again, reiterating, we are appreciating you staying here to celebrate the efforts of these students. And for those of you who are watching asynchronously, we appreciate you coming out and watching um, and we'll make it available if you wanna leave comments for them. Um, but having said that, it is Friday. <laughs> go have you a weekend and, and out loud. So go ahead and take your mutes off so we can actually hear it. Congratulations to everybody. I did a good job. Congrats.